Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, distinguished colleagues and friends. I want to take this opportunity. Um, there we are. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me to this panel and say how pleased I am to be with you all, even if it is only virtual. I hope all of you and your families are well and that everyone is safe. Now, when Zafar asked me to speak today, he said that he wanted me to talk about the relevance of digital earth to SGDs, to, to SDGs with a North American focus. Now, as the former Director General of the Canada Centre for Mapping and Earth Observation, I can't officially speak to you as to what is happening, but I do have a perspective and one that speaks to the challenges that I see in the work that I'm doing today to build on the vision of digital earth. Like all of you, I'm taking steps in a thousand mile journey to enable the vision. And today I hope to provide a glimpse into the 2020 world that Al Gore talked about way back in 1998. And in order to meet the five minute limit that, uh, that Zafar asked me to respect, I'll also keep things at a very high level. And I will also try to share my presentation. And where is the share screen? There we are. Prashant is just below the screen uh, next to the video. Yep. I'm there we go. Screen one. So do you uh, do you have the? Are you able to see it now? Yes. Okay. Terrific. So we could see the verb button there. Yep. The which? It's the text. It's the text. Page ah, one. Okay. The, the text. All right. That's not the one that you want. You want this one. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. in yes, 2020, thank you, and my apologies. So, in 2020, I would venture to say that despite COVID, the Great White North remains, from a circumpolar perspective, much as it appeared in 1998, visually speaking. We're dominated by ice, hydrographic and terrestrial shapes and forms that are vast and stunning and very similar to what existed when Al Gore enunciated the vision of a digital earth. We continue to be a zone that's rich in natural resources, biodiversity, and in cultures. But there are trends and shifts occurring in the north. And so if we ask ourselves, what is the northern context for the achievement of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals? And the relevance, for, we have to ask ourselves what the relevance is for the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and Digital Earth. Based on current projections and trajectories, we know that we will experience some profound impacts. We know from a circumpolar perspective that there is a loss of permanent ice there will be warming waters in the Arctic zones with corresponding impacts on biodiversity. We are losing, in Canada at least, several kilometers of coastline a year annually due to erosion. Climate change is also contributing to melting permafrost, which raises the specter of releasing GHGs and quite possibly new or very old strains of viruses. The Arctic ecosystem is fragile and it is deteriorating despite looking the same. These changes mean that there are some other trends. Melt, melting ice means more transportation by sea and more challenging transportation on land as ice roads melt and as permafrost is also melting, creating difficult, system, difficult uh, uh, environmental conditions to build roads and bridges. These changes also mean that 30% of the world's undiscovered oil and gas reserves may be accessible. New nickel, aluminum, and semi-precious stones and forests are also likely to be accept uh, accessible. Transportation routes could reduce shipping times by 30% over southerly routes. And all of this is occurring in an area where governance is regional, fragmented, and could possibly lead to a free-for-all in one of the Earth's last and most pristine frontiers. Now, 
what, hap what is happening in the North, to quote a phrase or to paraphrase, won't stay in the North. The scope and pace of change resulting from these climate trends will touch every sustainable development goal from 1 to 17. Now, just to give you some examples, economic activity will affect levels of poverty. It will affect hunger. Economic activity in the North, that is, will affect levels of poverty. It will affect hunger as local food supplies and access to potable water come under pressure. At-risk areas of economy and society will be exposed to greater inequalities of income, gender, and of Indigenous peoples and communities. Biodiversity in the ocean and life on land will be transformed. And so, how is it that we have to achieve the vision? What's the single most important thing that we need to do? Well, I would argue that the concept of digital earth is more important, but we have to be able to use tools that are at our disposal to embrace complexity, because what we are dealing with is the need to understand complex ecosystems, complex interconnections. And one of those frameworks that was talked about earlier, that Avaz talked about, uh, is the integrated geospatial information framework, which is which has been developed to help guide and establish approaches to geospatial data and technologies, and not so coincidentally to the concept of achieving a digital earth, where people from around the world can actually share in the achievement of local solutions to global problems. And this kind of integrated thinking, I would argue, will help us embrace the growing vision, uh, embrace and grow the vision of a digital earth. We also have tools at our disposal to help us embrace complexity and complex systems of thinking, such as data cubes and or lakes, discrete global grid systems that can visualize and represent complexity, new satellites that can see things that the human eye can't see, new algorithms and computational sciences that can see patterns in data that humans haven't been able to see. We are also on the verge of embracing much more fully vehicles that can go where humans haven't gone and where they don't want to go. And we also have the concept of digital twins and digital earths, which will help embrace that sense of interconnectedness and that sense of complexity. But in that context, I do want to caution that when we started on this vision back in 1998, we were optimistic. And in Al Gore's original vision, he optimistically focused on things like computational science, on satellites and other platforms, and the idea of the world in one meter optimistically hoped for the deployment of broadband networks, of interoperability and metadata. And while those ideas seem so siloed almost today, remember 1998 was a world without the GPS-enabled phone. It was a world where I think we were running 386 computers if you were lucky. And it was a world in which the digital divide was growing as a concept, and awareness of it was growing. Where Mr. Gore talked about the policy, possibility of virtual diplomacy and interconnectedness through these kinds of applications, today, we may have to be a little less optimistic and much more realistic and tackle some urgent issues Things like the ethical implications of artificial intelligence, global partnerships in things like new satellites and shared, shared Earth observation data platforms. We will need to rethink the concept of virtual diplomacy into a diplomacy that is less about competitive governance and more about collaborative approaches to governance and a shared desire to focus on science 
evidence and facts. All of these things are within our reach if we're realistic about the challenges and the vision going forward. There will be a very deep effort required to achieve a relevant vision of the digital earth and in helping to achieve the sustainable development goals. But rather than optimism, we'll also have to take a significant dose of realism with steely resolve to get the job done because the task ahead is quite significant and the relevance could not be greater than it is today. Thank you.